Today, I'm gonna to share with you how I made my first $1 million. And I'm gonna cut through the smoke and mirrors that a lot of influencers use to hide how much they're really making and tell you the metrics that you need to follow if you wanna make your own $1 million. There are a lot of misleading numbers on YouTube and on social media, from the $200 million CEO to the $50 million man, the nine figure this, the that. And some people are just using those numbers as shorthand. I think other people are actually using them as smoke and mirrors to make you think that you're not as successful, when the reality is some of the people throwing around big numbers are actually not doing nearly as well as you think they are. And if you're in business for yourself, they may not even be doing better than you are. As an entrepreneur my entire life, I've often thought, oh, that guy's doing so much better than that guy's doing so much better. And I've actually seen some of the numbers from time to time and realized that not only are they not doing as well as I am, but in many cases, they're living in very high tax, high cost living places where even if we were doing exactly the same, I'd be keeping twice as much money as they were. And so today we're gonna cut through the clutter and tell you some of the things that you need to be aware of because yes, there are people in their early 20s who are making $10 million a year. There are you know, guys who are 30 who have close to $100 million. Some of the influences that you see have been nomad countless clients, and we know they're actually making huge money. That's why I think there's no excuse not to be successful these days, because there are 23-year-olds making millions of dollars a year, and yet there's also a lot of other people who I think are just exaggerating. So. Let's talk about this very key difference that I don't see enumerated enough. There is a difference between revenue, profit, and what you put in your pocket. You could see someone saying, hey, I'm the $100 million CEO. Is that how much money you've raised? It's not a metric that I would think a lot about because I'm not in the money raising business. And I think if you are the money raising business, it's a little bit harder to be a nomad capitalist client because your VCs want everything to stay in the US. Or here's the valuation at which I've raised it. I go on Shark Tank, I raise a million dollars at a $20 million valuation. I'm the $20 million CEO. And in some sense, you're correct. I've never really looked at the value of my company as being part of my net worth because it's very variable. In the case of a business like ours, which uh, has a very low tax burden, we've actually been told you're gonna get a lower multiple because people, particularly in Western countries, don't understand and they somehow think like those margins and that low tax cost is like it's going to go away and they don't want to pay you quite as high of a multiple now that's why if you're going to sell your company we've you know helped some of our clients talk to uh m a firms where they work with buyers who are outside of the western world who are like yeah of course your tax rate is really low like that's how it works here in the uae or whatever else but that is an issue that comes up and so what's the value of a business it's often hard i've never really added that in my own net worth but that 100 million dollar ceo could be could be money raised could be valuation could be revenue Revenue in an online you know, consulting, online services, e-learning business, you could have 60% margins. You could have huge margins. Obviously, where those employees are, where your facilities are, you know, how lean you are, that will impact to some extent, but you've just got great margins. Most businesses, though, have 5 10 15% margins. Oh, my, it sounds terrible. I see some of these companies, and I look in the stock market. We made $100 billion this quarter, or something like, you know, whatever it is. And we made $1 billion. Oh, kill me. You know, do, do all that work, and then it's like it's up and down. But hey, I'm the $100 million CEO. Do I have $100 million in profit? And if so, over how long? I've sometimes seen people counting up like, hey, this is how much profit I made over five years. What matters to me is how much you put in your pocket. And I will come back to that point in a moment. But I want to talk to you about my numbers in the first million dollars on both of those last two figures, the actual revenue and then the actual profit. And so I started very simply at like 19 or 20 years old making cold calls on the phone. My early business was in the broadcast industry and it was very simple. I would find radio stations, mostly in the AM band, that were falling apart. They did not have huge audiences, but they perhaps had niche audiences. And they had very low advertising. It was one of the first radio stations I've worked with. They were making $10,000 a month. And they were in a rather expensive place to operate. We came in and I was 22 years old. I think we got us to like $60,000 a month pretty quickly. Now, there are radio stations in the United States even today that make you know $20 million a year. But for this little radio station, that was a pretty big jump. And so I would find these radio stations. I would call them and say, listen, I want this certain type of inventory that you have. And they'd say, okay, we'd haggle. In the very early days, I would just buy, you know, little pieces at a time. 
And then I would go out and I would find people who were advertising in other radio stations and I would call. You can call business to business in the United States and say, hey, listen, I have, you know, you're on in Phoenix, Arizona. I have this thing in, uh, you know, Miami, Florida. You know, are you interested? And I would make a spread on on that deal by negotiating the deal down. Maybe there's a volume deal. Maybe it was a deal, you know, people hadn't heard of this station. Maybe just the people on the other side, you know. I was basically a market maker, to, to put a nice spin on it, for, um, you know, certain kinds of broadcast inventory. And so I was able to make a million dollars in revenue by doing that. There were some times when people just paid the radio station and the radio station would send me a cut. But ultimately, the, the higher margin deals, they would just pay me. And so, I, you know, a million dollars in revenue, maybe I would make 200000 or, you know, two hundred two hundred fifty thousand dollars in that. So that was very simple. Now, how did I get into that? I went to a station where I was living in Phoenix, Arizona, and they employ, they were probably one of the best companies at selling the certain kinds of inventory that I ended up selling. And at that point, I was 18 or 19 years old, and I kind of wanted to be on the radio, but also be in business. My father had done that. He was a businessman by day, and for a good chunk of my childhood, hosted a, uh, a radio show in the afternoon. I basically said, hey, listen, how do I do a show? I need to bring in a sponsor. What do I need? They're like, listen, we'll put you on at like 11 o'clock at night but you need to bring in $60, $60 a week. And I'm like, all right. And so I did that for a while. And then I moved somewhere else. And eventually I just realized I don't really want to do the actual radio show part of it. But I got my foot in the door with this first radio station where, again, they were experts at people who could bring in their own sponsors. Sometimes the sponsor was the person themselves. You're a financial advisor, you're the sponsor. And I'd watch my father do a, a separate financial radio show, kind of the early precursor of everybody writing an Amazon book or having a YouTube channel. And, you know, he got hundreds of clients from being the guy on the radio who sounds authoritative, knows about money. And people called him and said, can you can you help manage my money? But the way that I learned about it was once I got my foot in the door at that first radio station, then I'm like, hey, listen, I don't really want to be on the radio. I don't just focus on the business side of it. Do you have like an opportunity? Like, what can I do to help you? And I said, and I think I suggested, hey, I'll read your website looks terrible. I'll remake your website. They're like, OK. I remade the website, but I used doing that. So I had the relationship, which allowed them to take my call, which allowed them to you know, say, hey, what can I do to live value? Then it's like, hey, what else can I do? Like, can I come in at night and produce some shows? And so I ended up, you know, kind of in different spots producing shows. What I ultimately settled on was I'm going to work at my house from, you know, nine to six trying to build my business. And I will come in and work for you. They had to pay me. I'm like, I don't really need to be paid, but they're like, okay, we'll pay you $9 an hour. And I would produce these, you know, mediocre radio shows where people were bringing in their own sponsors. But I got to meet some very interesting people and I got access to hang around and ultimately I became friends with the owner of the station's father who had done this for many years. He had a very interesting story and he became kind of an early mentor to me and taught me how to improve my salesmanship and all kinds of stuff. Eventually, how I got that to a million dollars, um, you know, an actual profit was basically just expanding. Ended up partnering with one of the people involved in the ownership of the radio station. You generally want people who are very divergent in partnerships, but we went out and, and kind of I used his whole experience to basically build up an entire business that netted a million dollars. And I mean, for me, very simple story of how obviously business is doing something yourself and then accelerating it. That's always been my lesson in life. I still get my hands dirty at times at Nomad Capitalist. I don't care how successful the company is, how many people we have, sometimes you've got to get your hands dirty. And that's been one of the things that I've been frustrated by as we've expanded, where you hire these very experienced corporate people who never want to get their hands dirty. I'm willing to get my hands dirty, and then some guy from Unilever doesn't want to get his hands dirty. I'm just totally opposed to that because I got in there and learned how to do it and then scaled it. Very simple simple business. And yet you see everyone who's trying to raise capital is just trying to like throw money at people building systems on the way up. So we scaled it, put people in place rather than like me doing the calls, expanded a direct mail, expanded a hiring people to, to do the calls, you know, all kinds of other stuff. As I'm doing this, I started to think, I don't really like living in the U.S. that much. And so like, theoretically, if I'm just making calls from a phone, you can get a, this is like the days of VoIP phones, making internet phone calls. Like I could just take this phone, plug it into my internet anywhere. And I can do it from anywhere. And I started to think, you know, taxes are pretty crazy here. I wonder how it works if I live overseas. And that's where I started to develop the idea behind Nomad Capitalist. Now it took me years of traveling and I would often run this business that I had. I remember one time I went to Beijing for a week 
and was able to do it without my partner even knowing him. I became pretty good friends and he was pretty cool with that. And I came back and I'm like, oh, here's your panda hat from Beijing. I realized I could run the business from anywhere. And so I started to build these connections of, you know, where to live, where to, you know, pay less tax, whatever. And that became the early days of Nomad Capitalist. And so when I left the U.S. for good, shortly after I sold this whole kind of broadcast, and there were a couple of different businesses associated with it. it was, this was not a huge exit, by the way. This is not, you know, some, some billion dollar exit by any means. Shortly thereafter, left the U.S. for good, started Nomad Capitalist. And over the years of my writing about my experiences around the world, started getting people asking me, hey, I have a business that I can run from anywhere too. And so I started c connecting people with the network of experts that I had found as I've been you know, traveling part-time and then living overseas full-time. And over time, what we developed was a system where we are the architect and the general contractor for people who want to move overseas, and you might need eight different experts. We have those eight different experts. We've shortened the learning curve that took me years into about a month, and we can create your plan for wherever it is that you're from, wherever it is that you want to move, and we can help you move to 31 different tax-friendly countries. That's what we've done in the last couple of years. We will help you leave your country, move to the new country, reincorporate your business, deal with your employees. Uh, if you need a second passport or you need a second residence because you want to live somewhere. Uh, we had all that from A to Z. That's been the business that now I've developed most of my wealth outside of the United States because people always want to save money. That's what Nomad Capitalist helps people do. And we are that architect and general contractor. Uh, it was a business that was born of uh, necessity, just of personal interest. And so that business wanted to become so much more successful than the one that was kind of just like, I like this, but just, do people need it as much? But no medicalist went on to be far more successful than a million dollars. And that was built outside of the United States, which to me proves the point that it's not the country you're living in that makes you successful. I was successful because I grew up in a family that taught me about hard work. Uh, I surrounded myself with the right people. I did things for people. I wasn't asking, like, I get messages from people, hey, like, do you just have time to hop on a call? There are a few people who have gotten through with that message because they did stuff for me. And I'm like, okay, this person is like really valuable. Let me, let me work with them. But most people just want something. I said, hey, I want to learn from you. What can I do for you for free? And that facilitated, you know, improving my salesmanship and, and, and just kind of tidying things up to make that first million dollars in revenue. Then be able to scale that with someone's help to make the first million dollars in profit. And then ultimately was able to take it to the next level by following the nomad capital capitalist principles of saying you can make a million dollars and you can pay 40 some percent of it in taxes. What if you made a million dollars and paid zero or 5% in taxes? That's the real game. That's what we help people do. And I think I learned that in the process of making that first million dollars didn't enact it right away, but ultimately did. And that's why I think much of my success has come from outside of the U S.